I am very excited uh, to be here tonight. First of all, thank you to the Thomas Crane Library for you know being a partner with us to be able to present um, a couple you know lectures and presentations that we wouldn't be having the opportunity to do considering you know uh, social distancing and the current restrictions that we have going on. Um, so thank you to the library. You know, also thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Uh, this is really exciting. We've got 122 people as of right now, so that's amazing. Thank you all for being here. Um, anybody who's new uh, to the Quincy Historical Society or to the Thomas Crane Library, you know, thank you for trying it out. We hope that you come back again. Um, and also for anyone who's either a member or a returning, you know, friend of the Quincy Historical Society, thank you for coming back and joining us virtually. Uh, this is really exciting, and uh, it's you know a, a good way to keep uh, to keep a, a member uh, to be, still be a member of the community even though we're still socially distanced. Um, so at this point, I think that I will jump right into uh, this project and this presentation. So I'm going to share my screen at this point. This is actually a um, redo of a program that we did, that the Historical Society did back in February of 2019, so almost a little bit over a year now uh, since we've delved into this topic, but it has become uh, current in a way that we could not have foreseen over a year ago, and so we were asked um, by the library and a lot of people actually have been coming to us asking for information that we had about Quincy and um, about the 1918 pandemic. Um, and thus why we're bringing you this uh, topic here today. So first of all, um, we've got revisiting. So that's why it's called revisiting Quincy's forgotten pandemic. Now the quote that I kind of want to start with here uh, is from an individual by the name of W.A. Brooks, who was the acting chief surgeon uh, in Massachusetts in 1918. And the reason why I bring up this quote uh, is because it, I feel that it really does emulate the attitude, the general attitude towards the pandemic after it was over, which was a bit strange, um, which I'll get into at the end of the program. But what it says is, probably the real history of the epidemic of the so-called Spanish influenza will never be known. Perhaps it is just as well that all of its horrors should not appear in print. So just a little something to chew on as we get going. So I'm going to be telling the story in five parts. And the first part, I really do want to explain the virus itself, um, where it came from, what it's actually about, and what um, it was known to do. So the virus uh, is an influenza virus, as you might have uh, surmised. In fact, its, a, uh, its scientific name is, uh, or designation is the H1N1 influenza virus. It originally came from an avian origin, so it uh, passed from birds to humans, um, and it is actually the same virus uh, that caused the 2009 swine flu pandemic, so it's one of the few viruses that has actually caused two global pandemics. A little piece of interesting information there. Um, so, it is most commonly known as the Spanish flu, but it is not Spanish. Now, that name uh, was assigned to it uh, generally in, by, the, uh, by the, uh, the newspapers of the time. Now, the reason for that is, has to do with um, wartime, uh, essentially wartime uh, suppression uh, and wartime censorship on newspapers. So during the various... Uh, during the World, World War I, which is, of course, ongoing at this time, what you have is um, a lot of newspapers being suppressed. And so you don't get good information. You don't get a lot of information about the flu being uh, passed out to people, to the general public, because uh, it would be considered bad for morale, essentially. Yeah, Alexander, I just want to let you know, we have somebody who's been a jerk uh, on the chat stream, so I'm going to work on kicking them out. Uh, so sure. I apologize for anybody who's being distracted by that. All right. Um, so, yeah, so it's obviously it's it's not a Spanish flu. There are a couple different uh, um, theories about where it actually started. Now, one of the first ones is actually a little bit surprising. It's Haskell County, Kansas, which you might not imagine and you might not think uh, when it first uh, starts or when you first think about it. Now, the reason for this is because Haskell County, Kansas has some of the earliest cases uh, or earliest recorded cases of what we know as the 1918 pandemic. 
Now, uh, they, you start getting a couple in a fort in Haskell, or a, a military camp um, in Haskell County uh, in January of uh, 1918. The other uh, theories about where it started are actually in France and then also in China. Now, in China, you do have a lot of uh, migrant workers moving uh, from uh, central China to Europe and digging trenches, and so that's one theory about how it's spread there. You also have a lot of uh, contact between animals and humans in along the front lines in France. So these are a couple of the different versions of how this could, of how this uh, virus could have actually jumped from birds to humans. A couple of the more modern or excuse me, more recent theories uh, that are being put out there are also the United Kingdom and also Vietnam. Uh, but the generally the three accepted theories are Kansas, France, or China. So this is uh, an interesting uh, thing to uh, contemplate. So that's so the reason why it's called the Spanish flu, though, specifically, is because during World War One, uh, Germany, England and a number of the other European countries engaged in World War I, they're suppressing their media. So Spain is actually neutral during World War I, and so their press is allowed to uh, report freely upon this pandemic, including on a particular case uh, that their king, King Alphonse VIII, or Alfonso VIII, I believe, uh, actually came down with a case of this particular flu. And so it became no becomes known as the Spanish flu because Spain is one of the only countries that's actually reporting on it. Everybody else is sort of keeping it hush-hush to keep morale high. So, what is usually commonly known about the, span or about the 1918 pandemic is that it has a series of waves, three waves in particular. Now, the, the entire span of the pandemic uh, starts roughly in January of 1918, but it, it goes pretty much through December of 1920. So it lasts about two years, but you typically only talk, or typically we only talk about three ways when we're talking about this pandemic. And in particular, when we're talking about this pandemic, we're talking about this spike right here. This is known, if anybody, can people see my mouse right now? Yes, okay, I'm getting some knots, that's good. Okay, good, so I can use that as a pointer. So this spike right here, this is known as the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, it starts in, very late August of 1918 and goes through roughly mid-November of 1918. This is where about two-thirds of everybody who died from the uh, 1918 pandemic, this is, this is when that happens. So this is really, when you're talking about the pandemic, this is what people are thinking about. Now, worldwide, you get about uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. That and that's about 675,000 in the United States. About a third of those deaths occurred just in October of 1918 alone, so about 175,000. So you, it is definitely the deadliest wave of the pandemic. Um, and this is primarily what um, this presentation is going to be focusing on. It is um, also one of the deadliest pandemics in human history, and that is partially because of um, a mechanism within the virus that essentially triggered an overreaction in the immune system of its victims and thus um, made it very, very deadly in particular. So this next slide, I am showing a rather famous um, cough syrup just to kind of highlight some of the more interesting techniques for medicine at the time. Uh, so just to kind of read the list of uh, ingredients in this particular cough syrup, um, you have alcohol at listed as the first ingredient, the second being cannabis, otherwise known as marijuana, chloroform, and morphine. Uh, my personal favorite uh, little blurb there is that it's skillfully combined with a number of other essentials, makes this remedy an effective and, benef and makes it the remedy, the effective and beneficial one that it is. Now, yes, this is absolutely going to cure a cough because once you take any of it, you're not going to be able to do much else. Um, so this is an excellent example of the fact that they do, in 1918, you medical um, professionals just really do not have a great uh, handle on how to treat influenza. Um, 
in particular, I have a quote from a book that I want to share. So this is uh, from the book uh, Influenza, The Hundred Year Hunt to Cure the Deadliest Disease in History by Dr. Jeremy Brown. This is available at the Thomas Crane Library if anybody wants to take it out at some point later. Um, so in the first chapter, the author is talking about different treatments for influenza. And I just want to read two paragraphs for you here today. So one of my favorite examples of how we fought the flu comes from the 1936 nursing records of an influenza patient, which were saved as a family heirloom and published 70 years later. Over a period of three weeks, he was treated with a punishing battery of balms, mustard plaster, a home remedy rubbed on the skin, aspirin for fevers, codeine for cough, phenolphthalein, a cancer-causing laxative, cough medicine, camphorated oil, seven enemas, seven, rectal tubes, don't ask, milk of magnesia, another laxative, God help him, urotropine, a bladder antiseptic, and tincture of benzoin. The patient received at least five prescribed doses of whiskey and 14 doses of castor oil. Actually, his seven enemas may have been medically necessary because he was given at least 39 doses of codeine, which suppresses coughing, but also causes constipation. Now remember, this was two decades before the great influenza pandemic, or after the great influenza pandemic. And yet patients were still being treated with Friar's balsam and castor oil. What we can conclude from Hopkirk's 1914 book and the nursing records of this poor overtreated patient is that doctors attacked influenza with a number of folk remedies that were at best useless and at worst poisonous. So this really does just give you an idea of the sort of you know, for lack of a better term, primitive nature of um, treating viruses at this period in time. Um, so some of the main differences between now and then really um, boils down to today we have a much better understanding of what a virus actually is. In 1918, they did not know that viruses even existed. They knew that there were, that there was something smaller than a bacteria out there, but not a, exactly what a virus was. Um, today, we obviously have better treatment for secondary infections, such as pneumonia. You know, most of the deaths from uh, this particular pandemic are actually listed as pneumonia deaths. Now, this is because, of course, uh, with the influenza attacking the lungs, that is going to have a that's going to allow for secondary infections such as pneumonia to set in. Now, of course, we have antibiotics to treat bacterial pneumonia, but that's but antibiotics are not useful for viruses in particular. Uh, we also have technologies such as MRI machines, which allow us to scan lungs and other body parts, as well as ventilators that, you know, are, are able to save lives in cases, you know, that would have been a lost cause in 1918. Um, so we have tremendous leaps in technology, but the number one best tool that we have today that they did not have in 1918 uh, is vaccines. Uh, having the flu vaccine, that is, it, it's actually the preventative measures um, that we have to, today that are actually the best in treating uh, the, the uh, influenza virus in general and preventing another pandemic like 1918 from occurring. All right, so, ta so at this point, I want to move on to the second part. So I've given you context about uh, the virus itself but now I actually want to talk a little bit more about uh, the state of Quincy in 1918, but also the state of America generally, too. So Quincy is at war um, in 1918. America entered into World War I in April of 1917. And Woodrow Wilson, who was president at the time, was the sort of person who was very laser focused on uh, meeting his objectives. So what this means is, or he called it a total war. So every single part of uh, American society was essentially taken and pivoted, pointed towards the goal of winning the war. Uh, so every single aspect of life was touched by this. You had Liberty Bond uh, parades being done at least monthly. You had all sorts of different programs like that. You had, uh, if you were not already uh, enlisting in uh, to fight in the war, you were being called up in the draft, or you had to be working in war work. That was one of the only exceptions to serving in World War I that you had was working in factories, for example, or working in shipyards, building things for the war effort. And of course, Quincy at this time has 
uh, a very prolific uh, shipyard. And so there are a lot of jobs in Quincy working at Four River. So this is a picture of um, downtown Quincy, the southern end of Hancock Street um, in 19, I believe it's around 1910. I'm sure Ed will tell me if I'm wrong a little bit later. Um, and you can kind of see here on the screen, uh, it might be a little bit blocked here, but you have on the corner what is, I believe today, uh, the Alba restaurant. On the corner here, you have the Greenleaf building. That little tower has been taken down since then. Um, what is not visible is the Stop and Shop headquarters, which would be here, and the Granite Trust building here, which was still 10 years away from being constructed in 1918, which that was constructed in 1928. Uh, so kind of giving you an idea of what Quincy is like at this time, a little bit earlier, but you still would have had dirt roads in much of Quincy in 1918. Um, and it, the population at that point is roughly between 40,000 and 48,000, so roughly about half of what it is today. Uh, something that is also very interesting is that, and will come into play during the pandemic a little bit later, is that Quincy was dry uh, in 1918. It had a very prolific and very uh, well-supported temperance movement, uh, so no alcohol of any kind was for sale um, or even legal to be purchased in Quincy at this time. And that it was extended you know, far beyond the parameters of the 18th Amendment itself. So this was uh, kind of an interesting feature of Quincy at this period in time. So this is a picture of the Four River circa, I believe 1915. Um, of course, this was a major source of jobs in Quincy. You had people coming from all over the country and all over the world, all over the state as well, to work in the uh, Four River shipyard. It had numerous government contracts to be building various battleships, uh, ships of war, as well as um, some of the early submarines, a couple of those as well. Uh, at least 3,000 men were employed. Uh, by the Four River Shipyard at any given time. I believe that it is actually higher than that, but I know that number off the top of my head because that will come up a little bit later uh, in the presentation. So at least 3,000 men would be, um, would be employed by Four River at any given time. Now, the Four River is so big that it even has a second division um, in Squantum. So this is a picture of the Squantum to River division of the Four River Shipyard. Uh, from 1917, so kind of giving an idea of just how big this operation really was. Now, I can't really talk about a pandemic without also talking a little bit about the established um, medical facilities that are already present in Quincy at this point. The first one of those is, of course, Quincy City Hospital. This is a picture that was taken, I believe, circa 1910 of the men's ward of the hospital. Now, in 1918, it the hospital only has 68 beds. And remember, that's serving a population of around you know, 45,000. So clearly that's not enough to really you know, support a community of that size should anything really bad happen. But it's also important to remember that doctors during this time made house calls. And so you even, um, it was really just the worst cases that would go to the hospital essentially. Um, to the ICU uh, to get medical treatment or, or operations, that sort of thing. So you didn't really spend a whole lot of time uh, in the hospital if you weren't mortally ill or injured. Along the same lines, the Four River Shipyard also has a, an established emergency hospital that has about 130 beds um, because you have accidents happening all the time at Four River. And of course, the closer you are to the emergency room, the more likely you are to survive whatever injury that you get. And injuries were quite common at Four River. You know, you're working on big ships, something slips, you fall, something breaks. Um, it's, it causes accidents were unfortunately quite frequent. Um, so this is a clipping from the Patriot Ledger from February 25th of 1918. It is a correspondence between uh, Major uh, Fred Jones, who is also a doctor, a very famous Quincy, or not famous, but a, he was the official uh, chief surgeon of Quincy at this period in time, uh, writing to the city of Quincy and also to the mayor, uh, Joseph Witten, uh, talking about the death of a particular individual, Cyril Morissette. Now I talk about this, or I include this particular image because, uh, I mentioned Dr. Fred Jones is the chief surgeon of Quincy. He's in Europe in 1918. 
This was quite common as well. Uh, you had a number of doctors and nurses who n naturally or would have usually would have been serving the community of Quincy, but couldn't during the pandemic because they were in Europe serving in the war and fighting in the war um, or helping on the front lines. So you have a severe shortage of help, of nurses, of doctors um, in, in Quincy, in Massachusetts generally, and also just across the United States. This is a very common um, pattern that you will see across the United States. And so, of course, this leads to some problems at when, as soon as a pandemic starts breaking out. One thing I also do want to mention about this article is that it does mention uh, Cyril Morissette. Cyril Morissette um, has a sister. Her name is Mary, and she actually dies of the 1918 pandemic um, on uh, September 16th. She's actually the seventh death that occurs in Quincy, and so you can't actually find her um, obituary a little bit later on when I start talking about the epidemiological spot map that we created. All right, part three. Uh, here I actually want to get into the history of the pandemic itself as it spread and it's kind of the narrative of how it spread through Quincy and what happened in Quincy and why this was such an interesting um, story for us to uncover. So first of all, um, it enters into the, or the second wave of the pandemic, specifically this is what I'm talking about, entered into the United States simultaneously, or you get three simultaneous outbreaks all over the world. The first uh, is in, of course, Boston, Massachusetts. So that is the in introduction point uh, from for the pand or for the second wave of the pandemic into the United States. The second is um, in France, particularly in the city of Brest, which is in the north uh, west region, I believe, in, a, in an area called uh, named Brittany, uh, and then also uh, in Sierra Leone, where dock workers interacting with uh, ship uh, sailors on ships actually get sick, and then and thus it passes. Uh, from there to points beyond. Now, the second wave is actually reported to have started in Switzerland and American uh, intelligence agencies uh, got reports about this really horrific new disease that was starting and it was said that it was probably the flu, but really they believed that it was actually the Black Death because the symptoms were so severe. Uh, but of course, later on, they do realize that it is indeed the flu. So it is the 28th of August when uh, the first cases arrive in Boston. And it's actually, we know exactly where the cases came in from. And this is Commonwealth Pier. It is what is known today as, I believe, the, World, the Boston World Trade Center. There is a receiving ship, which is essentially kind of like a, a hospital or a dormitory for soldiers coming back and forth uh, through from Europe. Um, and so these so a few soldiers staying on this receiving ship are showing symptoms of becoming very ill. A few days later, of course, you've got about uh, a couple dozen soldiers getting ill. And from there, it spreads to, because you have mingling and the movement of troops back and forth, it spreads to the Charlestown Navy Yard and to Camp Devons, uh, about 30 miles west of Boston. And then from there, it only takes a few days for it to jump to the civilian population. Now you have a history of the various Navy officials and the various um, Massachusetts government officials becoming very concerned and writing about the fact that they were very concerned about the, um, the pandemic spreading. And I believe that there is one quote of this particular um, board of health official saying on, I believe it was the 11th or 12th of September, you know, if this gets out to the civilian population, this is going to be a big problem. And that is also the same day that you get some of the first deaths in Quincy. So this is uh, a, the earliest shot of the spot map that we have, showing the first recorded death in Quincy of the 1918 pandemic. Um, so this is particularly the blue dots that you will, or the blue dot that you will see right there, that is the Quincy City Hospital. The red dot, that is a, uh, a death that occurred on September 10th of Annie Teresa Room. She was 33 years old and her death certificate says that she died of low bar pneumonia. Now you will see this quite often that many of the death certificates will actually give a different reason for the death other than um, the Spanish flu. So we did have to do a bit of sleuthing and a little bit of guessing to figure out exactly, okay, is this 
Um, if they're in a certain age range and it says pneumonia, which was usually a, uh, a side effect or a um, subsequent infection after having had um, the flu, uh, that, that is very likely that this person um, died from, uh, this, from the pandemic. But if that doesn't convince you, um, on September 11th, you have Malcolm Neal Clark, who, who's 32, who definitely died of the pandemic. So if you don't believe the first one, you can certainly believe the second one, uh, who, because we were able to confirm using uh, the Patriot Ledger that he did actually die, although his death certificate d died of uh, the pandemic, even though his death certificate said that he died of typhoid. The newspapers confirmed that he did, in fact, die of the pandemic. So... This is a shot from the Patriot Ledger, um, which is from September 14th, which is the first acknowledgement of the pandemic that you find in the Quincy newspapers. So you still have already had a few deaths at that point, um, but if you read the headline, if you can, if you can read it from, because uh, it is fairly small print, but I'll read it for you. Uh, report that there are over a hundred cases in Quincy. So by the time that you get the first reporting at all, there are already a hundred cases in Quincy. Now what's also, um, I'm also gonna read the actual blurb to you because it's not very long there. So more than a hundred cases of Spanish influenza have so far been reported in Quincy, of which at least two uh, resulted fatally. Among these stricken are two Quincy physicians whose names were not given out. As far as it is known, the only two deaths that have resulted in the city from the epidemic are those of William J. Cohane, age 13, son of Mr. and Mrs. Cornelius um, Cohane of Faxon Road, Atlantic, and Daniel J. McDougall, aged 15, of 7 Bryant Avenue, West Quincy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Daniel McDougall a little bit later, so I just do want you to keep that name in the back of your head um, as we continue on, because his story is particularly um, tragic, and it's one that I, I, I kind of want to finish off with instead of talking about it right now. So ne next up we have, uh, fast forward about a week, September 19th, and you can, as you can see, You've, the disease has spread quite a bit. At this point, you have about 15 or 20 deaths in the city, and we have no idea how many cases there are. But at this point, uh, you do get some interesting things happening uh, in Quincy and in the country that are uh, kind of somewhat parallel to what is going on today. So, for example, you have um, various individuals from uh, the you know, the heads of the Board of Health and from, you know, some of the best hospitals and universities all over the country, some of the brightest minds in medicine at the time coming to Boston, coming to Massachusetts to study this pandemic and this outbreak. Um, now, when they get here, the quote that really strikes me um, as remarkable is that one of the most famous uh, and, and the brightest minds in medicine, uh, when he actually observed an autopsy of influenza victims, his quote about it was, this must be some new kind of infection or plague. He did not recognize it as influenza at first because it was so severe. Um, so I was looking briefly at a book at a, and quoting from a book called uh, The Great Influenza by John M. Barry. Really, it is one of the best books on this particular topic. But I quote this one specifically um, because it also gives some very good descriptions of uh, what the effects were. And I'm not going to get into them terribly here because they do get quite um, graphic, shall we say. But uh, the one that I, I think is most useful uh, or the, is the one about after seeing an autopsy, he's looking at the lungs of a victim and is seeing that the results of the influenza, this particular strain of influenza, are, are resemble more in a mustard gas attack than an influenza. So this is, of course, a very, very... Um, virulent and very uh, aggressive uh, influenza. So you can forgive a, an expert for not quite recognizing it at first. You also get a number of interesting stories um, of uh, essentially doctors struggling to adapt to the times and struggling to uh, figure out exactly what they should be doing and how they should be treating patients. So there's a, an analogy that's being used today, which is quite apt for what's going on at this point in the, in, uh, the 1918 pandemic, which is that they're building the boat as they're trying to sail it. Um, so they're trying to figure out exactly what the best practices are for how to deal with this pandemic, 
at the same time, they're still trying to figure out exactly what this pandemic even is. And so it's very difficult, of course, to be giving people good advice when you don't really know what advice that you should be giving. You also get a, couple, uh, a number of different stories about the pandemic, such as the name, the Spanish flu, as one, but you also have a, uh, an American colonel who is um, theorizing that this is actually a German biological weapon, um, that this is actually warfare from the Germans. Um, of course, that does not catch on very well because it's quite, <laughs> if this was a German biological weapon, then it was also uh, impacting uh, the Germans quite badly as well. In fact, you also have another German general uh, postulating that this was an American biological weapon at the same time. So this, you get a lot of those types of stories being passed around as well. So on September 19th, you get another interesting development, which is that the hospitals and the emergency hospital uh, in, at the Four River are full and that they are starting to need more spaces to actually treat patients. So the neighborhood club, um, on Glendale Road, which is actually still there to this day. It's a very lovely function hall, uh, becomes an emergency hospital, which includes an additional 50 beds. Now, three days later, later excuse me, all of those beds are full, and eight people have already died um, at the neighborhood club. Now, the other thing that I find very, very interesting about this period is that the neighborhood club emergency hospital is staffed almost entirely by volunteers. These are, essentially, these are civilians from Quincy who, when they were called to, went to this emergency hospital, went into a place where they were going to be face-to-face -face with a very highly infectious, highly deadly disease to be able to help those who had been stricken by it. They were putting their own lives on the line, and in fact, many of them did get sick, and sadly, many of them did die themselves from this disease because they were helping those who were in need. This is honestly a remarkable piece of history um, that you do have, you know, just members of the community reaching out and helping their the other members of their community. Um, so I do definitely want to just stress that, you know, a lot of these emergency hospitals ended up being just staffed by volunteers, by regular men and women from all across Quincy. So moving on, um, this is a very interesting headline. So situation is very serious. Epidemic situation in Quincy said to be the most serious in the state. This is from September 21st of 1918. So this is actually the uh, headline that got our attention at Quincy Historical Society. It was the one that made us think that we that this should be a story that were that might be worth looking into, and as it turns out, it was. Um, also on this day, um, you have a couple other reports saying that uh, nurses and doctors from Philadelphia are arriving in Quincy to help manage the pandemic. That is how bad it was that people are coming from other states uh, to now try and help uh, manage the pandemic in Quincy. Uh, at this point, three more emergency hospitals are also announced. They are uh, three dormitories, uh, or we're going to be dormitories for housing workers for the Four River, uh, uh, located on Chubbuck Street that were converted quickly into uh, essentially uh, ho makeshift hospitals. So each of those would have another 50 beds, so that's 150 beds total, they would, and they would open over the next couple weeks. You also have outside of the various uh, clinics and hospitals, uh, guards being posted to keep people from going inside and actually visiting those who are um, infected. Uh, you also have undertakers uh, are no longer able to keep up with the rate of people dying. And so they actually have to open up the receiving tomb in Mount Wollaston to try and, and, and essentially store bodies while uh, the undertakers uh, try to keep up. You also have an, an advertisement essentially from the telephone company posting, uh, apologizing for interrupted service because so many of their um, uh, switchboard operators are calling out sick. So this is really becoming very serious very, very quickly. Now, Quincy's peak is from between September 21st and October 5th. So this, that is the peak of the pandemic in Quincy. At this point, we're at, still at uh, September 21st, the city is becoming overwhelmed. They physically cannot, the leaders in the city physically cannot deal with the crisis and are looking for help. And so they, they do something quite drastic, actually. Um, and that is that they actually turn to the Navy, uh, to the military, 
and turn over control of the city and control of the pandemic to the Navy. So of course this headline reads, Navy Medical Department is now in charge. Cooperating with the Board of Health, they will make systematic effort to stamp out Spanish influenza in Quincy. So the person who is put in charge of Quincy is a man by the name of Lieutenant I.E. Stowe. He's also a doctor, so that of course helps. Um, he maps out the city into six districts corresponding with the six wards at the time. One doctor will be in charge of each district and they will report back to him every single day. He also um, probably implements one of the first information hotlines in Quincy. So he actually had a dedicated phone line that people could call essentially a 311 line uh, where people could get information about what to do about uh, the pandemic. Now the same day, it is reported that 3000 men call out sick from work at Four River. Uh, so that is quite a lot of people um, who are sick. Now we, we can't actually find out how many people actually got uh, the pen or fell sick with influenza during 1918 uh, for a number of reasons, which I'll get to later on. But just that number alone, that 3000 people call out sick just from the Four River, that is quite a number uh, of those infected. It's also noted that at this time that the immigrant population seems to be a bit harder hit than some of the others. And so again, I will talk to, uh, about that a little bit more later. So this is also, oops, hopefully that you can actually see that. There we go. Um, this is also one of the famous headlines you may have noticed from even the advertisement for our talk here tonight uh, of what happens and this is uh, as you can see from september 23rd of 1918 the board of health finally votes uh to close all theaters halls bowling alleys and pool rooms notably though um soda fountains are allowed to remain open um and also schools schools still remain open at this point now it's interesting because uh because uh, lieutenant stowe actually believed that the schools were better equipped to actually keep an eye on the children uh, if they were to come down with the flu, uh, and that they would be better cared for there and could be sent home quickly if they did become sick, as opposed to being at home and wandering around outside and potentially getting sick and infecting others before someone can notice. So schools are kept open for the time being, but that will change. Now, effectively, what this does is, you know, enforce a form of social distancing, although quite a lot less strict than what we have today, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, people still were going to work, um, and the reason for this is because it was wartime. There, you could not stop war production in the middle of a war and still expect to be able to uh, fight and still be able to fight that war. This was uh, a decision, uh, you know, that was made more or less across the board everywhere in America, that the war was the most important initiative um, and that public health would have to take a, a back seat to the war initiative. So that was a decision that was made. So the next day you have another decision that is made, and that is that public funerals will now be prohibited. So this is on the, I believe the 24th, yes, 24th of September that this was uh, decided, the Board of Health uh, decided that they would uh, prohibit funerals and also close down a few other businesses. Um, you also have um, undertakers being directed to close caskets immediately so that you could not have wakes and that people be buried as soon as possible. Um, lodges and societies are requested not to hold meetings for the foreseeable future, and they do comply. You get a lot of ads see in the Patriot Ledger at this time um, saying that they that um, societies will not be meeting this week because of the influenza pandemic. Um, so this was this is yet another headline that was posted in the Patriot Ledger on September 25th, and this one of course reads: "Believe the crisis has been passed," um, although it, you know we still have a couple cases that need to be ferreted out. Um, to be precise, it has not in fact passed, and the worst part of the pandemic uh, starts on September 26th through the 30th. So it, it in fact has not passed at all. Um, in fact, on the September 25th, that, this is when Governor McCall of Massachusetts actually decides to and makes the mandate to close down all of the schools. It's also reported that um, at Four River of the 130 beds in the emergency hospital, every single one of them is full and they only have, excuse me, 18 nurses to serve 
all of the patients. So that is a seven to one ratio of um, patient to nurse, which is of course much higher than you would ever want it to be. There's also speculation in the newspaper about whether or not good weather is going to help the disease. And you see this go back and forth quite a lot as you're reading through these news articles. Well, maybe, the, maybe with the sun, it will mean that everybody can open their windows and air things out and that that will make it go away. And then that doesn't happen. And then the weather turns and they say, well, maybe the, when it's cold and rainy, everybody will go inside and won't be infecting each other as much. And so that's gonna make it go away too. There's a lot of that sort of hypothesizing about what is actually going to help get rid of this pandemic. Um, and this is, and of course, this is something that we can relate to today. Um, the next day after the headline about the crisis, believing that the crisis has passed, of course, the headline reads 15 deaths from the epidemic. So of course, this again goes back and forth quite a lot is that one day it says things are getting better and then the next day things are terrible and back and forth and back and forth and it's, I'm sure it was uh, rather confusing to be reading at the time since newspapers were really your only form of news aside from, you know, your neighbors. So this is September 26th and also one of the really uh, devastating things is uh, one of the sub headlines there that several nurses are now among the sick. So even the people who are trying to help are starting to really succumb to this disease. Um, at this point, it is also decided that people will be allowed to dig graves themselves if they would like, as there is a rumor going around that there's actually a black market for undertakers, that there's people going around in the dark of night and burying people. Um, uh, we were not able to confirm whether or not this was actually true, but this was one of the ways that they tried to stem that rumor by actually allowing people to bury their loved ones themselves. Uh, the very odd thing about this page, though, that you can see is down here, game to be played. Um, this is a um, Four River baseball game, very strangely, was allowed to continue despite the fact that the pandemic was, you know, still going on. I'm not sure about the wisdom of that particular move, but I'm uh, it's not going to comment <laughs> much further than that. Um, so this is another... Uh, ad that you saw in the newspapers on the same day, September 26th, uh, talking about some of the best recommendations for how to deal with the influenza, also known as the grip. Uh, this gives you a combination of some very good and very bad advice. Um, there is quite a lot of emphasis about um, keeping milk clean and making sure that, so you can see here, uh, in the second paragraph, so the community should see to it that sanitary measures are adopted to keep the milk clean and free as possible from bacteria and should have a good water supply. There was a, quite a lot of alarm over milk supply being contaminated. Um, I believe this has something to do with um, theories at the time about the spread of tuberculosis um, and then ha thinking that perhaps influenza was spread in a, in a similar way. But you do also get some legitimate advice in here too. So keep others from coughing and sneezing into your face. Keep patient in bed until the doctor has just charged them. Although my favorite one is this first one here that you'll see on the screen. The disease is spread by the breath and secretions of the body, more especially of the nose and throat. For this reason, wash your hands after handling the sick and only approach them with at when absolutely necessary. Above all, avoid kissing. So... This was actually added in by uh, one of the health commissioners on the South Shore, a man by the name of Woodward, who has a really funny quote, and I'm paraphrasing it slightly, but was very adamant in his belief that kissing was what was spreading the, this particular pandemic and said something else to the effect of, you know, if only all those girls would stop kissing the soldiers, this wouldn't be so much of a problem. Um, so he says this multiple times, and so that is how this particular phrase uh, winds up in this advertisement. And of course, you know, you do get some other uh, legitimate advice, such as um, number four there, which is boil sheets, pillowcases, and towels used by patients to try and kill off the, the germs, boil dishes, etc., used by patient. Um, and then also some strange ones, keep windows of sick room open. It was thought that by having good ventilation, this might help uh, with the, uh, the disease, and also keep flies out of sick room. So a mix of advice there, some useful, some not so much. But again, this is the doctors trying to sail the boat as they're trying to build it. They're still building up evidence about what works and what doesn't. Now, 
again, and so here's yet another um, uh, paragraph here, another advertisement that you see multiple times throughout uh, the, the Patriot Ledger talking about uh, milk producers and making sure that you are keeping um, your milk pure here and that there would actually be um, potentially some legal trouble if you were ever caught tampering with the milk supply. So this was, you know, taken very, very seriously. Um, on the 27th of September, you do get a headline of uh, believe that the crisis has been reached. In this particular case, the 27th is definitely one of the worst days. And so that's kind of the peak that you reach there. So uh, that particular issue also reports that 50% of the workers at Four River are out sick. They don't give a number though. And that the Red Cross is desperate for new and more volunteers to help. Um, one other very interesting side note is that it is reported that um, whiskey and brandy are sorely needed in Quincy. But of course, as I said earlier, uh, Quincy's dry. And so you can't actually hire a courier to come to Quincy to bring you brandy or whiskey because it would be illegal for them to do so. So Quincy actually has to specifically ask the Boston Board of Health to send in whiskey and brandy specifically for medicinal purposes uh, so that it could be handed out legally. So this is a, you know, a rather um, unfathomable fathomable, um, predicament to be having today um, to, you know, not be able to get medicine for whatever um, is ailing you, uh, but also, you know, indicative of the medicines of the time that one of the chief um, medicines that you would need to treat the flu was, you know, whiskey. Um, but, you know, you can, that can help with a cough. Um, I can attest to that myself. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So this is actually a sign that was posted in the Charlestown Navy Yard that was um, you know, talking about um, measures and essentially it was an information campaign to try and cut down on the spread of the influenza. Um, I, uh, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant Stowe actually did uh, require such signs to be posted at the Four River Shipyard. So they probably read in a similar way. So for anybody who can't read it, it reads Spanish influenza has endangered the prosecution of the war in Europe. There are 1,500 cases in the Navy Yard. 30 deaths have already resulted. Spitting spreads Spanish influenza. Don't spit. You do also have similar signage campaigns across the United States that says um, spitting spreads death, so don't spit, um, which is, again, an interesting side note that there was such a rash of spitting that they needed to make these types of signs. Um, you, so... Um, sorry, I lost my place there for a minute. Ah, there we are. Um, you also have on September 28th, which is when um, uh, Lieutenant Stowe actually posts all, uh, mandates that all these signs must be posted, churches uh, voluntary de voluntarily decide to cancel their services. Up until this point, they had been holding services, so churches do stop meeting and houses of worship do stop meeting at this point. Um, similarly, on September 30th, um, the final emergency hospital opens in the form of a hospital train. So it's actually a train car that's outfitted to, to work as essentially an ICU uh, that was actually uh, railed up from Baltimore, parks at, this, at the Four River, and is actually being used to treat doctors and nurses um, in Quincy and to keep them separate from other patients. Um, so that is just an interesting side note there. At this point, I wanna show you, I know you're gonna see a blank screen for the moment, but I wanna show you a quick video that actually shows, um, it's an animation of the spread of the disease through, through Quincy and it kinda, it really does give you a very uh, vivid idea of what this was like. So you can see this here. So Quincy and the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. Blue dots denote hospitals or emergency clinics. Red dots denote victims. And so I'll just let this run here. So this is about a minute long. And it lasts from September 10th through October 31st. But you really do get a very good idea of what the spread was like. And you see the neighborhoods where the clusters are. Um, of course, many of the first cases starting in North Quincy and Wollaston. And then, you know, the, the majority of the cases uh, showing up in South Quincy, Quincy Point, and West Quincy. 
you know, areas like Squantum, Howe's Neck, Adam Shore, Germantown, they were not as heavily populated as they are today. Um, so that kind of accounts for some of the absence there. But then you also have areas uh, like President's Hill in this area, which was about as, um, was fully populated, but clearly does not have as many uh, dots. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that later as to why that might be, but you really do get that, you see that cluster of, um, of deaths in uh, South Quincy, West Quincy and Quincy Point. So at this point, um, this is actually a, an advertisement for Liberty Loan subscriptions to essentially, uh, their bonds, their war bonds, to essentially try and pay for the war that is still ongoing. Now by October 8th, headlines start reading, the epidemic is under control, and that is, mo for the most part, that is true. Really, the epidemic only lasts about five or six weeks in any one given location. Um, before it burns through the population and kind of goes on its merry way. Um, by October 22nd, uh, all of the bans are lifted and essentially life goes back to normal just in time for Halloween, in which case you have a number of various Halloween parties that are being thrown and go off without a hitch. Now, you do get a resurgence of uh, cases in November. Uh, and in December of 1918, because with the end of the war, you get soldiers coming back from Europe again, and they're coming home right in time to infect their friends and family as soon as they get back. I shouldn't laugh, but um, it's a bit ironic. So this is something that does happen. But for the most part, the, the, the worst part of the pandemic in Quincy is certainly over by October 31st, though you do still have a number of cases that come up, and I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, so at this point, uh, moving on to part four, which is talking a little bit more about the data that we came up with, because you saw that spot map that we created. This was, of course, a very in-depth endeavor. We took a, quite a lot of time to do quite a lot of research about each of the victims um, to be able to present that to you um, as much as possible. Now, of course, this comes a, across with... Um, this, the, the result of this was that we have quite a lot of data to sift through. So this was a unique opportunity not only to create a spot map, um, and in the process cre of creating that map, uh, we found quite a lot of interesting info. So let's get into it. So this is a page from one of the Quincy City Records for the year of 1918, where you can see a list of the causes of death that occurred in Quincy for that year. Now, if you go down to kind of the middle bottom of the page, you can see influenza, and the number that they give is 184. Um, that is quite a low estimate for how many cases of influenza that Quincy likely had at this time. Now, when the Historical Society was doing this research, we also included, going up a couple points, pneumonia, because like I said, a what often happened with this pandemic is that you had a secondary infection of pneumonia. Um, and so we also take, took a look at the 78 and the 136. And so putting those together, you get another um, 214 additional possible cases uh, that could potentially have been um, resultant of the, uh, the pandemic. So what this meant was that we had a lot of research to do. Now, fortunately, all of the names um, of the deceased are included in this particular issue of the Quincy City Records. So we had a list of names to actually look up and find all of their death certificates. And so one by one by one by one by one, um, one of my, uh, my coworker and my boss, um, uh, Dr. Ed Fitzgerald, actually went through and researched and looked up every single one that we could think of that had um, that seemed to have uh, been that seemed to have died around this the right time uh, during the second wave, and also be around the right age for what we thought were typically going to be victims of this pandemic. And so, and was we were able to confirm and go through and see as many and find as many of these victims as we possibly could. Now we limited our search from September 10th, which is when we know the first death occurred, through October 31st, um, mostly for the sake of time. Uh, because we were trying to do this on a fairly condensed time frame. Our, we had about two months to do research before we had to present this in February. Um, so we needed, we couldn't do the entirety of the pandemic, although that, who knows, we might do that in the future. I say, um, 
and Ed is watching and I'm sure that he's laughing at me right now. Um, so you can see that there are, of course, a number of the, these deaths, but this is probably a low estimate of how many people actually died. There could be a, a hidden number of cases, honestly, anywhere in this list. Um, you know, you could have anywhere from five to 600 total, which would be about 1% of the population. But what's really interesting is that if it's only about 200 people or about, I think it was about 250 people that we got onto uh, the spot map, um, that is incredibly low. That is only 1% of the entire population of Quincy at that time, which for a pandemic that averaged about 3 to 5% of, of a given population, that's very low. So that's actually potentially quite remarkable that Quincy managed uh, to not have more deaths than they did. So the next slide uh, is a, yet another chart from the same uh, city report. Uh, and this one is contagious diseases reported to the Department of Health by month 1918. So influenza is all the way down at the bottom right here. And if you go over, you can see that in October, they report 266 cases. In November, they report 36. And in December, they report 559, going for a total of 861. Now that's all well and good. But as I said, if you look at September, there's nothing there. And that is not because there were no cases, as we can see by the newspaper reports where you have 3,000 uh, men calling out of work uh, from, the, uh, from uh, the Four River Shipyard, um, I believe on, uh, on September 21st. There's not no it's not that there's no cases. The reason for this is because influenza was not made a reportable disease in Massachusetts, meaning that no one was actually keeping track of how many cases there were until October 3rd. So you are missing an entire month worth of information here in September. So this number is far, far, far too low. So looking at our map, this is kind of some graphs and some graphics that we actually made. And shout out to um, our, one of our volunteers and friends, Tom Scott, for helping us with uh, making these particular graphics. He's actually with us here tonight, I believe. Um, so these are a series of um, graphs and graphics that were made uh, to reflect our research and what we found. And, and uh, some things we were not surprised by, some things we were surprised quite a lot by. And so starting off with some of the things that we weren't surprised by, uh, the mortality rate by date, this kind of shows the quote unquote, the curve of the surge in Quincy. So you really do see that September 21st to 25th, uh, you have quite a high peak here, September 26th to 30th and October 1st to the 5th. That is really the worst part of the pandemic. Now, what's interesting about this is that the national average for the peak is actually about three weeks later in uh, mid-October. This is when you really get the peak elsewhere. And this is really just reflecting uh, the fact that Massachusetts was the introduction point of the pandemic into the United States. So they, their peak is quite early. This is the mortality rate by age. And yet again, um, this is quite common for uh, what you see elsewhere um, in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And you really have that very um, peculiar um, peak here for those who are between the ages of, you know, 20 years old and the ages of, you know, 40 or 50, uh, which you do see elsewhere in the, in the world as well. Um, so you do, it's just that grouping of those who are young. Now, the reason for this is that people who are young, they have stronger immune systems. And this particular trigger that I mentioned at the beginning of the program uh, about um, that essentially triggers an, an overreaction of your immune system um, that is more likely to happen the stronger your immune system is. So it makes sense that though if you are younger, you potentially are more likely to die of this particular pandemic because of that unique function of this pandemic. So similarly, this is just to compare. This is a um, graph made by the CDC, uh, kind of tracking the, the dotted line is a usual um, it, uh, mortality rate. Um, in a uh, in normal influenza um, season of the, by age. And then the, the solid black line that is showing um, 1918, as you can see there. And you do, of course, get that bump right in the middle there of those who are younger. Um, again, we now moving on to some of the bits of information that we found rather surprising. One of those was the mortality rate by neighborhood. As you can see, 
about 70% of this pie chart is taken up by just three neighborhoods. And we saw that in the spot map itself with the groupings in those three neighborhoods. And this, of course, accounts for South Quincy, Quincy Point, and West Quincy. West Quincy being uh, the most with 20, at 27%, South Quincy at 24%, and Quincy Point at 19%. Now, uh, we're not entirely certain why this is, but we have some theories. This is um, slightly, these neighborhoods are slightly more heavily um, populated at the time. People are living, bigger families are living in smaller houses. So you have more people sort of commingling. Uh, this is where a number of uh, the sort of the workers for Four River are living, especially in Quincy Point and in South Quincy, and that many uh, granite workers are working in West Quincy. So that'll come up again in just a second, but uh, worth mentioning because this is this was a surprising because some of the rhetoric around the 1918 pandemic, especially at the time, is that it is an equal opportunity virus. And this is a virus that is going to attack you and potentially kill you no matter what your socioeconomic standpoint, no matter what, where you're from, what race you are, it is um, the great equalizer, for lack of a better term. Um, and yet we're seeing that some of the more working class neighborhoods of Quincy seem to be more severely hit. Now, this is somewhat accounted for by the fact that it is more populated, but as we'll see a little bit later on, uh, there are some hints that perhaps uh, it, it hit these communities a little bit harder because they happen to be a little bit less wealthy. So this, in fact, being that chart here. So this is a chart that is looking at the mortality rate by someone's place of birth. So Quincy um, at this time, as I said, has people coming from all over the country, all from all over the world to work in Quincy at the shipyard, in the granite industry, that uh, in those various um, positions. So um, and of course, they're predominantly living in many of those neighborhoods that I'm uh, talking about. So you see that about 47% of this pie chart is taken up by individuals who are actually born outside of the United States. Um, so that's quite a lot. Um, but also, so this is, you know, accounting for the immigrant population. Um, you also have the 28% the who are second generation. So one of one or both of their parents uh, were immigrants themselves. And so if you include those two together, that accounts for 75% of everyone who died uh, was part of the, the quote unquote immigrant community. So what this, this is actually backed up as well by a, the report on September 23rd uh, about immigrants communities seeming to have been very badly hit. So this is, we see this reflected in the data itself. Um, so this is also disproportionate um, to roughly what we estimate the immigrant population in Quincy was at the time. So those uh, essentially of first generation immigrants, we think it's around 30%. And that would put um, second generation around 60% of the total population. Uh, so yeah, first generation and second generation together would be about 60% of the total population. So you do see them disproportionately represent, potentially disproportionately represented here. Um, and the last chart I want to show you, let me move this here, uh, is the deaths broken down by occupation. And again, this really does um, show that some of the more working class areas are, are harder hit. The, the two tied for first place in terms of the most deaths make sense. The Four River Shipyard having uh, 57, and then also the, we counted housewife as an occupation because let's be honest, that is absolutely an occupation. Um, and also what's worth noting, uh, noting is that many working class women also would have worked as domestics within other households and thus potentially would have increased their exposure because they would have been working um, outside of their own home and mingling with other individuals. They also potentially would be married to workers within these other industries. Um, you also, of course, have uh, labor and granite um, in uh, second place there. So this is, um, so labor could also be divided between the Four River and granite. So that is worth noticing, but granite, of course, being quite a big um, chunk there. And then the next one being office, retail, and service. And the smallest um, uh, chunk there being management and, uh, and professionals. So this is basically all of the information that we were able to glean just from doing this research. And I want to finish off by going to and debuting um, a very special project that we've been working on. This, now that you can see it, 
is the Quincy History blog. Um, so this is a project that we've been working on very recently um, and having quite a lot of fun with it. Um, but as you can see here, it will be a source for um, media content from Quincy Historical Society. And we've already got a couple posts already up, uh, including a digital exhibit about the Spanish, about the Quincy and the flu pandemic. Um, we've also got a series coming out from uh, Dr. Ed about Sacco and Vanzetti and the Quincy connections there. We've got um, a little short history about sort of the, uh, reflecting on the 100, the going just over 125 years of Quincy Historical Society. And also um, we're gonna have a Howard Johnson's exhibit quite soon, but let's take a look at the flu pandemic. So this article will have some of the information that I included uh, here tonight, including an interactive version of the spot map. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, including that video showing the spread that I showed you, including all of the charts um, and graphs that I shared here tonight and some of the um, inferences that we got. So you can actually go and visit all of that information. Um, but really quickly, I do wanna show off this blog. You can all still see me, yes? Good, now I'm paranoid. <laughs> no, you're doing great, totally Good. fabulous. Okay. So like I said, this is a um, interactive version of the spot map that's hosted through Google Maps, where you can see all of the different bits, or excuse me, all of the different points of information um, that we entered into. So you can actually click on any one of these and see, infor per see information about what information we could find about these individuals. So for example, we have Maddie Forsyth. Um, she's originally from Scotland. She's 28 years old when she died. She works as a domestic, a housekeeper. She's unmarried. She was treated at home. Cause of death was influenza pneumonia. Um, and also we include whatever um, news articles that we have that we could find in the Patriot Ledger, we included those clips as well as much as we could. Um, and this is, you know, simultaneously a tool for research. It's a tool for, um, you know, increasing your understanding and, and exploring this, you know, really tragic event. Um, but it's also, you know, really important to remember that each one of these point, these red dots, that's a person, you know, that is an individual and this is a life, an incomplete snapshot of their life, but it's a person. And so I'm, I'm looking at right now, I have uh, Daniel McDougall called up and this is one I, the one I remember, I uh, asked you to remember uh, a little bit earlier in the talk uh, because Daniel McDougall, he was 15 when he died. Um, when we did this presentation back in February of 2019, um, one of the descendants of his sister actually came to the talk and had a photograph with him of Daniel McDougall. I didn't, you know, want to share it on there without uh, that person's, you know, without the family's permission, but we got to see actually a photograph of Daniel McDougall. Um, and he told us a story about Daniel that really, I found really poignant, um, that I, I wanna share if that's okay. Um, you know, Daniel, like I said, he's 15 years old. He comes down with, he's one of the first cases of influenza in the, in the city. You know, he's working in a shoe factory in Boston, so that's possibly where he contracted it from. His mother works as a domestic in Quincy. Um, and when her, as her son is getting more and more ill, she actually is getting, she's getting desperate of course. And she actually walks into Boston or as, so the, the story in the family goes, uh, to try and get her son whiskey, medicine, essentially, to treat his, um, his influenza. And presumably, you know, on her way back, um, you know, he dies very shortly before she returns home um, and with the medicine for him. So, you know, this is, it's, it's a very personal story and it just, it really was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably not doing it, the story justice because, you know, hearing it, see in the room with everybody else there, seeing the picture, it, it was just a really moving um, story, a really moving um, anecdote. So yeah, I just want to share that with all of you. Um, and my very, very, very last slide here, I promise, go back to the PowerPoint for just a second. Quincyhistory.org backslash blog, you will be able to find uh, that map right there. Um, also, if you just Google, um, uh, the Quincy, 
Quincy uh, Influenza Spot Map 1918. I believe it comes up on our Facebook page um, that you can find it there, but this is definitely the easiest way to get there officially. So write down that link if you can. Um, and uh, so that we, you can, it's, it'll be the link to the, the map is right there on the front page. Thanks. So yeah, at this point I am, you know, I've gone on for about an hour and a half or yeah, almost an hour and a half. Um, so I'm, I, I'd love to take some questions if we still have some time. Yeah, we definitely have some time, uh, especially since we had some distraction and, and some challenges getting started at the beginning. So yeah. I thank everybody for their patience as we get through that. Um, there's lots of praise coming in in the chat. There's a couple other questions. Uh, Wayne and Ellen were remembering some stories that you told about uh, living conditions at the Four River Shipyards. Um, and and we were hoping, I think, that you would share yes. a couple of those stories um, again. There was an article, um, I believe sometime in October, I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering it, but um, essentially talking about just overcrowding at the Four River. So of course, you know, you have um, over 3000 people working at this one facility and so they need some place to stay and they're usually living in dormitories or, or um, uh, essentially lodging houses. So like, you know, you're gonna have anywhere from 20 or 30 people, probably all staying in the same house potentially, um, anywhere from 10 to that much, depending on the size of the house. So this of course gets overcrowded. Some of the, the conditions um, in the newspapers being, as they report on it, um, in, in other articles for unrelated purposes are really describing some you know bad conditions where you have you know five or six people living in the same room together. And so that's, you know, not a great situation uh, when there's a pandemic on, uh, when you have, when you're supposed to be distancing as much as possible. And so um, hopefully I'm remembering the details that Wayne and Ellen wanted me to tell. But yeah, it really does, um, that certainly does have an effect on the pandemic in Quincy. Yeah, like the colleges that were sending people home at the beginning of exactly. this pandemic. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yes. Um, another question came through, people were wondering if there was a second spike in Quincy in 1919. Um, somewhat, I, we, I went a little bit into the newspapers into 1919. Um, you definitely do get spotty occasions of just people saying, oh yeah, there's some more cases here, but nothing on this scale and certainly nothing that was getting the same level of attention as the pandemic was, understandably so. You know, you do get, I think I looked at the, um, the city directory and they probably get like two or 300 cases over the course of 1919, especially, or like in the first couple months. Um, so certainly nowhere near on the scale. And by that point, they sort of figured out what to do. So they're, they're not too concerned about, you know, another out, really severe outbreak. They're able to nip it in the bud. Cool. I don't know if people have other questions. Um, there, there's certainly a lot of praise coming through. Um, that pe you know, people really appreciating the blog and what a great work that was. Uh, somebody talked about how their great grandmother's first cousin, uh, Catherine Spain Berry, died of influenza on in September mm. 20th of 1918. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, there is a question whether the City of Quincy Cemetery database is publicly accessible. Um, so if you have any re uh, advice about how to search uh, data um, cemetery records. Um, so I'm bl oh my goodness I'm blanking. I know that it that parts of it. Are acceptable are accessible. I don't know if Mount Wollaston specifically, um, but I can definitely do some more research into that and put that up on the digital exhibit to get some more info when I get some more information. And because that would actually be an, an excellent thing to link to um, if I can get access to it. So um, if there's anybody listening who you know has a very specific way for us to do that, I'd love to to add that in there. Um, but off the top of my head, unfortunately, I don't have the an easy way to do that. Great. And if you, when you discover, you can share it with us, the library, and we'll be happy to share that with all our reference librarians so they can help people find it too. Well, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple other things people have said. Uh, let's see. Some of the people have found some great historical records in Google Books uh, and lots mm -hmm. of them digitized. Uh, someone whose father almost died of the flu uh, in scarlet fever and revere when they were a year old in 1918. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'm just reading through the rest that we're here. We've Lots gotten a lot histories. of people talking about, you know, coming forward with their family histories with it. And, and it's always, you know, fascinating and really, you know, touching to hear these stories. We've had many members come up to us and just, you know, say, oh, yeah, my, like my family member and died of this. And, you know, here's what I know. And, you know, a few people who've actually learned about family members who died um, because of this project, which is also really exciting for us. Yeah. There's a question of, of 
if you have some conjectures why Quincy was disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So, so that's the thing is we, we didn't actually find too much evidence that it really was that like that it was worse than elsewhere, despite what, you know, the Patriot Ledger is saying, because um, obviously Boston is, you know, very badly hit. They have a bigger population. Um, famously, Lawrence and, um, and Fall River, both cities have fared very badly during, um, during the pandemic. Um, but maybe because Quincy was just, it got bad so early, so quickly, um, being so close, located so close to Boston and having, you know, um, such a dramatic response uh, to the pandemic, maybe they got help sooner. And that actually helped um, get things get things rolling. You know, I haven't done enough research into the responses elsewhere in Massachusetts to really be able to say if it was that much worse. What little I've done really sort of suggests the opposite. Um, and so maybe people being alarmed by the state of Quincy actually helped save lives. We were just hit early, so. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, there was a question, there was a question of T. Mead uh, because he said, you know, people should contact him. We wanted more information also uh, about how to do the, re the research because he was, that was the person, I, I, I'm, I'm gendering it, I don't know if it is male or female. T. Mead, whoever you are, I'm not trying to assign any, you know, any assumptions. Um, <laughs> but if you would like to share either with me personally or with Al uh, Alexandra, uh, my email is ccheever at ocln.org. I'm happy to share that uh, and, and share any communications with folks on help you connect with people if you don't want to put contact information right in the chat stream. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll type out my email address. There was also a question about where people can see a recording of this if they join us a little bit late um, or just would like to have, a, a, have it be refreshed. Um, and you know, visit this again. Um, so we were able to record it all here in Zoom. So I have to wait for that Zoom recording, you know, piece to, to all the magic, the, the durables, to, you know, finish running through their cages. Um, but then uh, I will be uh, making it available on YouTube as soon as I can get a copy. Well, I'll probably share it with the folks at QATV. We'll do a little post production and clean it up just a little bit. But I'll ask Mark um, to do that if he can do that quickly. So we'll get it up on YouTube as, as soon as possible, and we'll make sure that there's a link. Um, uh, we'll, we'll also make sure there's a, an easy link from uh, from our website for people to find it. Excellent. And we'll share that with you so you can put it in the blog. Oh, very much so, yeah. yeah. We, we intend to. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other final questions? Bef um, also, just for our own benefit, um, for anybody who's interested in, you know, further reading, if, you know, after hearing me talk are just, you know, not sick and absolutely sick of this uh, particular um, topic, uh, I have a couple recommendations for books. Um, Great. You know, we, uh, one by Catherine Arnold, uh, Pandemic 1918, Eyewitness Accounts from the Greatest Medical Holocaust in Modern History. Uh, this is a very in-depth piece. Um, it's a little dry, I would say, is my only complaint about it, but it definitely has lots of really interesting, as it says, eyewitness accounts and personal stories there. So if that's the angle that you'd like to, to uh, see, that's really good. Um, the one that I cannot speak highly enough of is The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History by John M. Barry. Um, it is a tome that he spent seven years researching. Um, it's one of the ones that I actually own for my own edification. Um, it is so thorough. And if you want to understand this pandemic, that is really the one that I would recommend reading. Next up, I would say, is um, Influenza, The Hundred-Year Hunt to Cure the Deadliest Disease in History by Dr. Jeremy Brown. This is one that's unique because it's actually written by a practicing medical professional. Um, that was the one that I read the description of the um, somewhat archaic uh, uh, treatment at the top. Uh, that was the one about, I will say, the enemas. Um, next one is Skip Desjardins' book. Apologies if I'm butchering his name. Uh, September 1918, War, Plague, and the World Series. This is probably one of the more unique perspectives on this um, topic because it links the World Series and um, the pandemic. I wasn't sure about that connection there, but it was certainly very interesting and added some context that I hadn't seen anywhere. And it's the only book that I've seen that actually includes Quincy's experience in it. So that's worth it for the local history, if nothing else. Um, and then one other that I really do recommend for general sort of perusing is the, Influen uh, the Influenza Encyclopedia, which was produced by the University of Michigan Library. Um, I accessed it today, so I know that it's working, and it is a really, really cool archive of, I think it's something like 50 different cities and how they responded to the influenza, so really, really good um, information there. 
Thank you for that list. We spoke before we had people here about this whole presentation and are you going to make this presentation available from the blog? So people. Oh, absolutely. Have yes. So, um, yeah. And I can copy what I did for the Irish history class that we did last week. He also had a bibliography or, or, or suggested reading. And I took that and did some links to where people could find the books in our catalog. Um, did links to Goodreads if people wanted to go and look for alternative sources and have another source. Um, and some of them were in the public record, so I was able to put links to the Internet Archive. Um, so some books. So I'll take this list and be glad to do something similar so people can go in and further, you know, have an easy way to get into these books. So Fantastic. That'd be great. There was another question, which was uh, whether if you have any idea how the uh, the, the, the pandemic, um, how the flu of 1918 was actually cured. Um, and, you know, People obviously did not get vaccines. They didn't get, there weren't even, I don't think there were tests so that you, they could know when they could, was safe to go back out again. And that's obvious in a lot of our minds right now. How do we recover from this current pandemic? Yeah, no, that is, that is, um, you know, a really, really good question. Um, I stopped sharing now so I can actually, you know, look you in the eye as I yeah. finish up here. Um, so the way the, essentially the way that the, that society got over the pandemic was that it burned through the population. We, Essentially, enough people got it that that our society established what is known as herd immunity. So essentially, you know, the virus ran out of people to infect easily. Um, also worth noting is that over time, the virus became less deadly. So it actually mutated between the first um, wave and the second wave. It mutated to become more deadly. And then after the second wave, between the third wave and subsequent, it, as it you know, just became part of the regular seasonal flu, um, it became less deadly over time as our immune systems became more used to it. So essentially, it, this, it's an excellent example of, you know, what happens when you don't have access to a vaccine or viable treatments for, um, for a pandemic. Then I think that maybe the final comment of the night may be somebody who was, who was uh, reminding us that 1918 was uh, for a long time the you know, the last year that the Red Sox won the World Series for a long stretch <laughs> there. Uh, and so maybe there's a, you know, when baseball re resumes, it's going to be a good time for the Red Sox. We can could be, could be. be so hopeful. Hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed as always. Right. Alexandra, people have really appreciated this. I know the people wanted to give a shout out to Ed for his leadership and, and helping yes. support this. And I was glad to hear you mention yeah, um, there's a lot of people we could thank uh, who are, you know, help the historical society and, and, and are working behind the scenes to support this. And um, I know we all appreciate them very much. So yeah, no, it, it was, yeah, kind of shout out to Ed, especially for, you know, not looking at me like, or laughing at me like I was crazy when I suggested doing an epidemiological spot map, um, you know, and shout out to, you know, two of our volunteers, Nick Drake, who really helped me input a lot of the data into the map. Um, and then also um, Tom Scott for, you know, helping us create those really great graphics um, that really does help you visualize the, the information a lot better. Well, it's, a, it's an impressive team effort. So I really appreciate yes. everybody. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's really great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And I'm really glad that we were able to share this. Everybody was able to come out and join us. Sorry for the, 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 the trolls who attacked us earlier. Hopefully that wasn't yeah. too distracting for you. Um, but uh, we got them all off and, and we'll try to figure out what we can do in the future for future programs so that we can keep them at bay. But we persevered and as, as we will do. So yeah, thank great. you all so much for joining us as well. Like this, this was fantastic. And th thanks for being interested in it. Great.